This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. The idea for this episode of the podcast began in Einsiedlen, Switzerland, during my recent visit to Zurich. Einsiedlen is located 25 miles south of Zurich, about five miles from the southern end of the lake. It's an idyllic, picturesque mountain town that was so beautiful, it was surreal to me. I was there to visit with Dr. Robert Hinshaw, a Jungian analyst and the founder of the Daimon Verlag Publishing House. We had a wonderful meeting full of stories, and his office window looked out onto an enormous Benedictine monastery that's home to the Black Madonna. I'd first learned of the Black Madonna's existence through Marion Woodman's book, Addiction to Perfection, and when I told Episode 7 guest Christina Becker that I'd be visiting Zurich, she told me that I just had to go see her. Dr. Hinshaw sent me on my way that evening with a copy of the book The Black Madonna of Einsiedlen, an ancient image for our present time. It was written by a friend of his in the United States, Dr. Fred Gustafson, who had been a fellow student at the Jung Institute Zurich back in the 1970s. Dr. Hinshaw suggested that after I went across the street to see the Black Madonna, I might want to interview Dr. Gustafson when I got back home. So my guest today is Jungian analyst, author, and pastoral counselor, Fred Gustafson. Dr. Gustafson received a Doctor of Ministry in Psychology and Pastoral Counseling from Andover Newton Theological School in Boston in 1968 and a Diploma in Analytical Psychology, which is the degree of a Jungian analyst, from the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich in 1975. Along with his book on the Black Madonna, he is author of Dancing Between Two Worlds, Jung and the Native American Soul, and a contributor to the books Betwixt and Between, Patterns of Masculine and Feminine Initiation, and Lifting the Veil, which explores Islam and the repressed feminine. He is editor and contributor to both The Moonlit Path, Reflections on the Dark Feminine, and most recently Pierre Tellard de Chardin and Carl Gustav Jung, side by side. Since 1984, he has been involved ceremonially and personally in the life and culture of the Brule branch of the Lakota Sioux in South Dakota. Here's Dr. Gustafson. I have your book here, The Black Madonna of Einsiedlen, an ancient image for our present time. And I was wondering, why an ancient image for our present time? What did you mean by that? Well, let me let me uh, make a comment before I actually get to that answer. When I went to Zurich, um, I, I left with my family, my wife, myself, and two little children in 1972. And a few months into being in Zurich, oh, we were suggested to go down to Einsiedeln and see the Black Madonna. And of course we did. And when I went down there that first time, I was a tourist. I mean, I thought this was an interesting curiosity. Uh, but I had a bigger concern at that time, and that was how to make a living, uh, get into the program, would I get through, and so forth and so on. But uh, I would say a year into the program, a year in a few months, I read a book by Heinrich Zimmer, who was a contemporary of Jung's. It was titled Art and Symbol in Indian Myth and Civilization. And in that book, he talks about Kali of India. Now, Kali is a horrific goddess, but deeply, deeply loved. She's totally black. Her tongue hangs out. She has a necklace of skulls and um, a, a, a belt of severed hands and four arms. And she has three arms. One holds a, a sword, another a severed head, another a club. And the fourth arm is a lotus bow of offering a gift. I was fascinated by her. And then it dawned on me like a light went on. We have a black goddess down the road about 50 kilometers, mm. known as Einsiedeln, Our Lady of Einsiedeln. So that's when it started. When I stopped being a tourist, I became um, fascinated by her as a, an archetypal image of the, of the psyche and of our culture. So that's kind of getting into an answer to your question. I saw her. See, I'm, I'm a, a guy. I'm white and I'm not Catholic. So why should I be concerned about a black goddess of the Catholic tradition? Right. OK, well, I was fascinated and am fascinated by her because she's bigger than male, white 
and Catholic. She's an archetypal image around the world. And I, I wrote my thesis on her in the, at the Institute and had a wonderful opportunity to interview a couple of the monks down there about her and um, visit her many times. And when I go back now, I, I consider myself a pilgrim and not a tourist. Mm -hmm. And I find myself standing in front of her sanctuary, which is at the west end of the great cathedral, which is interesting, too, because the west is where the sun goes down. It's not where the sun goes up. Mm -hmm. And in other you know, words, she captures that missing compensatory side of the Western psyche. Now, keep it Western right now. She she captures the, what's been missing. We're very white. And as you know, we're very male in this culture. Right. Where's the other side? And as a man, I know women have been on top of this. But as a man, how do I tap into the feminine archetype in a way that is not sentimental? There's nothing sentimental about the Black Madonna. Mm -hmm. And this is always a bit dangerous for a man to say, but I think a lot of the women's movement also has been um, missing that non-sentimental aspect of the uh, feminine archetype. Yeah. It, you know, as a man saying that, like, what right do I have? But I'm going to say it anyway, because many women can get into the feminine issues, but where's the dark feminine, the side that really knows the deeper issues of life? And I, and I understand historically the process of women coming into their own. These things happen. But all of us, male and female in this culture, need to be in touch with the darker, more non-sentimental, uh, but creative sides of the human psyche. Could you explain w exactly what you mean by the dark feminine? Yeah, she, <clears throat> she would capture for me uh, the mysteries of life that cannot be explained but need to be honored. She would represent the sides of the human psyche that are ever creative, always giving, that can tear us apart in order to get our attention. Like the dreams, for example, you made it very clear. Our dreams do not disguise. They do not try to make us feel good. They tell us the truth, okay? And so the, to me, the dark feminine is that side that is ever there in favor of life, but not in a sentimental, I'm going to be nice to you because I'm supposed to be nice to you way. It's there to shake our tree psychologically so that we will get the message that we are children of this earth. I'm telling you what's happening today, just how this translates into environmental issues. We can no longer be sentimental about the earth. The earth is always going to be here. It's for us only and so forth. There's not one part of the environmental system that is broken, that would not affect human beings. That to me is the black Madonna in all her mystery and glory. So I had this a conversation with Marion Woodman when, when we got back. She had read my thesis and we were sitting down over a cocktail or a cup of coffee, I don't remember. And we were talking about the black Madonna. This was way back, 77, 78. And uh, she said, you know, Fred, the black Madonna is the earth. And it's like a light one out. Of course she is. The black it's the earth herself, the earth that takes back into her and the earth that gives of her to all of life. That's environmental. That's the environment of our own psyche. You know, like we are born of humus. That's what makes us human beings born of the earth. And so it's not just the earth out there that we walk on and see and smell and touch. It's our own body that's earth. We're all connected. You take one part away. We're all affected by that. So, okay, that's one translation of the Black Madonna, but she is the deeper part of ourselves. So anyways, I, when I wrote this book, I thought, okay, where's this going to go? And one, uh, one person, or I don't know how this came up. I think I got a letter somewhere saying, I can't believe a man is writing about this. And I kind of smiled because, well, my ego was kind of proud, <laughs> but the other side was, why can't a man write about this? Because right. ladies, she's my goddess too, yeah. psych psychologically and spiritually. Then there was one more step that this made for me personally. It was the road that evolved in my individuation. The dark feminine, the mysteries of life, the deep connections to Mother Earth. And from there as an American to Native American spirituality. Mm -hmm. 
because I was born in a context uh, of Christian theology, okay? I was uh, sent to a, a church uh, when I was five years old by my grandparents and uh, became Lutheran. It was not by choice, just the way it worked out. I went on to become a Lutheran minister, then went on and became, uh, got my doctorate and then went to the Young Institute and so forth. So there's a long, long history of, of Christianity. But all along, it was a good, it was a good journey too. There's nothing really harsh about it. But there was a piece missing. And that was the piece connected to earth and native, not Native American, though it came off that way for me, mm -hmm. but indigenous in sense of defining indigenous as being born within the context of the earth, Indo within Genesis to be born within the context of the earth. And in that sense, Laura, every one of us are indigenous. Not only do we have an indigenous past, or indigenous today, and that's the piece that's missing. And I think that's a piece that's connected to the dark feminine. So my journey took me into Native American spirituality, and I happened to find myself on the on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota mm. in 1984, uh, doing a vision quest, what they call the Hambletia, which means cr one crying in the night. Uh, but it's really we call it the vision quest, and. Um, when I left after doing that, and I worked through a medicine man out there, I said to my wife, well, I've, <laughs> I've done my thing. I don't need to go back. Well, in fact, I did go back. And for 31 years, I've been going back. So what that has done to me is strengthen my uh, Christian roots by putting roots into the earth. You know, Christians talk about reincarnation. But reincarnation, all of life is incarnated spirit. And, you know, to me, that drives the whole black Madonna issue or the black feminine issue into our religious lives of people in the, in the Western world, too. A lot of peoples around the world know this. This is not new to them, mm -hmm. that everything they see around them is endowed with spirit. They talk to animals. Animals talk to them, trees talk to them. And we in our Europeanized mind, we can, we can uh, kind of snicker about that. But stop and think. At one time, we were able to do that. And if you sit quietly long enough, the world will come to you and it will talk to you. Not in English, right. but talk to you. And I think poets know that. I think great novelists know that. Great songwriters know that. Artists know that. But the general run of people are really starved for deep spirituality. Deep spirituality mean the dark feminine for me. Oof, long answer. No, that's wonderful. Would this be a relationship with our own unconscious? Uh, certainly. It, it takes off on that idea. Because, you know, I think it was Jung that made it kind of uh, clear that the unconscious has a strong maternal dimension to it. She is, it is the mother that gives birth to consciousness, the ego, and so forth. Look at your dreams in a way that can inform you, not terrorize you, because the unconscious isn't here to terrorize us any more than the dark feminine is here to destroy us. I mean, it was, I, it was a tantric mystic named Sri Ramakrishna who was asked, why is the black Madonna, why is Kali black? Why is Kali black? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, she is black only because that's how you see her. Mm. And in, this, in, in, in the end, he said, she has no color. Oh. And I think that's kind of what we're up against now. Is the unconscious really out to get us? Is, is the earth with all of its horrific things going on, on now with the weather and all this stuff out to get us? No, it is the result of our activity. It's here to nurture us but it's not sentimental. I'm going to underline that word today. It's not sentimental, but neither is it cruel. The Black Madonna in Ein Siedland that's on the cover of your book, how did she come to be there in that tiny little town in Switzerland? It's pretty remote. I mean, it was a long journey for me to get there. It was not an easy trip. How did she get there? Yeah, there are actually about 
470 some black Madonnas in Europe, and I think many of them in remote places. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, that there's a history behind that. There, it goes way back. I do mention that a bit in the book of her background, but it really was not um, something that people were aware of in terms of being, her being black until uh, there were the French invasion. I think it was 1798 uh, or 99 around there, and uh, they knew that if the French could capture that statue, they would have the entire canton. So the monks buried her. Um, my history is a little rustier. It's been a while, but I think they took her and they buried her for a couple of years. And um, when they um, dug her up after the French left, she had gotten mold in, on her and it was pretty bad. So they had someone restore her and he found that she was dark because of uh, candles and that were go going on night and day in her little sanctuary. And she, he really re restored it to the original shape. And uh, not shape, it's a uh, color. Mm -hmm. European red lips and whiter skin and everything. And when he displayed her to the people, they were very upset. They said, that is not our mother. She, our mother is dark. And that was the beginning of awareness that they wanted a black Madonna. And this was happening in other places too. It happened in other happens in other places. And Szczesnowa in Poland, Our Lady Szczesnowa in Hove in Poland is a very powerful Black Madonna, long history. And um, I know Lech Walesa, I am told, wore armbands with her picture on it back in those days, and it was she who would liberate Poland from the communists. They believed. Mm. And there's Montserrat in Spain. It's mm -hmm. an incredible. Black Madonna, we visited there many years ago, and she sits very high up at the altar end. She overlooks the altar, and people can actually walk up, and they can reach to a hole in the glass that surrounds her, and they can touch her toe. When I was there, there was a mass going on in four languages, and the place was packed. Major pilgrimage site. And then there are others. But one more I can think of quickly is Our Lady of Guadalupe in, uh, in, a little, in a community just outside Mexico City. Yes. When we were there, uh, again, I bet I bet 10 years ago, I mean, if you don't think religion is alive, go to Mexico. And uh, here was a, a young, I would say, teenager on her knees, I don't want to say, quote, unquote, walking, quote, unquote, on her knees with an umbrella over her head held by probably a grandmother across the piazza to the sanctuary where the uh, Our Lady Guadalupe was. And she was going there to do whatever she had to do. And this, this is living liturgy and she's powerful. It goes way back in time. Uh, so, and she's dark. What I found fascinating when we were down in Mexico uh, earlier this year, we went into some of these churches, kind of just tourists and everything, but where there were pictures of Guadalupe, every one of them were white-skinned Guadalupe pictures. And I thought, well, what is that about? Mm -hmm. Who did that? Did the priests, the church of the time, and so forth? Because she's a dark-skinned goddess, and she's really the goddess of all the Americas, though I think of many Catholic, white, white Catholics in uh, North America don't know that. Very, very powerful lady. So you mentioned that there are hundreds of Black Madonna statues throughout Europe. What about here in the United States? Is she present anywhere? No, uh, there are replicas around. I did see one. Um, it was an, a non-ecclesiastical replica. Um, I, I don't know. If, I don't think it's still there anymore. Uh, but it was at the entrance and exit of the San Francisco airport. It was done by Benny Biafufano. And it was a sculptor. It was, um, to describe this. In fact, I think there's a picture in that book. Oh, in fact, I know there is. It's a missile shaped figure of the Black Madonna at the very top where it kind of comes to a point is this face he's carved. Yes, yes. Totally black, totally black. And she holds in the folds of her skirt St. Francis, who has four eyes, which is a symbol archetypally in numerology of wholeness. Mm -hmm. She's totally black. When I saw this, this was way back, oh my goodness, in 1982, maybe, we were um, going to be spending a little time in California. I drove a, 
about 150 miles back to the airport just to take that picture because I, I had not heard of any other like it. And I don't think it's there anymore. But yeah, that's the only one. It's on page 17. But what does that say? I, I'm trying to really kind of describe this for people. Why are there hundreds of Black Madonnas throughout Europe and really none in the United States? What's underneath that? What do you think's going on with that? Well, it's probably, we would need to do an analysis of the American culture. You know, we're, we're still a pretty young culture trying mm -hmm. to find our way. And um, we came here as immigrants, you know, except for Native Americans, but we came here as immigrants trying to find our way and really quite independent. We we're, it's kind of a rugged individualism. And um, I think the European people have had a longer time for themselves building a relationship to their own earth. I mean, you talk to a Swiss person, they're very passionate about protecting the earth of their country. They're small. I mean, we're big, you know, we, we yeah. never seem to run out of land or trees or animals and whatever. We're always going to be fed. We're always going to be taken care of. In Europe, it wasn't quite like that. They've been through many wars and I know when the World War II happened, I mean, even Carl Jung had a, a, a vegetable garden in his garden because he didn't know about the food supply of Switzerland. Mm -hmm. What was going to happen? So I think that their roots go deeper. Our roots don't go deep enough yet, but our roots, and Jung made this clear too, really uh, go into the Native American ground. He said most, most people, the conqueror takes on the attributes of the conquered. Mm -hmm. And he saw it an Indianization of the American psyche. Now you could say, yeah, yeah, maybe. And I, I, we can, I I'll, I'll be one to back off of that. You know, I'm telling you only what Jung said. And I think there's some truth to that, that our roots haven't gone deeper as the European have roots. And mm -hmm. uh, thus the black Madonnas just have not appeared here. We brought our Ameri we brought our European uh, stuff with us, but we didn't bring our black Madonnas with us. That's so interesting to me. So was, Again, I'm trying to just kind of really get a grasp on where she came from. Was this done consciously where people said we want a statue? Because she had to have come from somewhere. So somebody created these statues. Somebody made these statues. And were they conscious of the fact that this is the dark feminine? I mean, in Switzerland, I don't want to generalize, but pretty much it was all white people that's right no you're right right so where did the idea come from that we'd like to make a statue or have a statue here in our church and we want her to be black i'm just trying to yeah understand <laughs> where, where does that where did that start who's the one that decided let's have a statue in this church of the mother and child and let's make them black well, Laura, I think you asked a very difficult question because every every statue, every painting has its own history. But my, I would, I'm guessing because how does one know these things? But mm -hmm. I, I'm guessing there was not a great intention. Oh, I'm going to paint this statue black. A lot of the statues, I think, did become darkened because of the candles that uh, burn night and day in their little sanctuaries. But there are paintings that were darkened too, and it may be that something in the inner world of the artists that just wanted to capture mystery. And that that's something that um, is really missing a lot in our culture. Yes. And I think they were, they were closer to that sense of mystery. Life and death were very close to each other uh, not so long ago in history. I mean, there were uh, families, uh, a woman would give birth to 10 children and then she might have three or four still alive. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, life and death they were partners, so to speak. And so the, the mystery of things were closer and the reality of the darker sides were closer. I think painting dark for white people, I think was a, un let me put it this way, maybe a deep unconscious need to paint things dark to grab the mystery. And you also mentioned in the book that she represents a compensatory perspective. So if we're not even aware of it, and the unconscious is compensating for something because it's what's missing, isn't it? Exactly. Again, I go back to what I said earlier. We're a very white culture. Even 
uh, among the, the best of us, we tend to get caught in the white the whiteness of things, and we're very male. So compensatorily, dark feminine would try to fill that gap or balance it out. And if we get the message, well, it works out pretty good. If we don't get the message, it becomes on any even stronger. It's just like a dream. If we don't get the message of the dream, it will come on stronger. If we still don't get it, it may come across as a nightmare mm. until we finally get the message. It's not trying to scare. It's just trying to awaken us. And you mentioned that Ein Seedlin has become a place for healing. I don't know if it always was, but... You write a lot about that in the book, that Pilgrim's journey to Einsiedlin to see the Black Madonna for the express purpose of healing. Not all, but some do, and that there are crutches and braces that people leave behind after their healings. Yeah, she seems to have had more power for healing than many of her white counterparts. That's been true, I think, in other uh, Pilgrim's uh, Black Madonna sites. I think when all else fails in the medical system, people turn to the odd. And I mean that kindly. I don't mean mm-hmm. in any negative way. They'll do what they have to do. And and amazingly, sometimes that's what happens. I mean, the odd is what, what can bring the healing. I know even in the medical professions, when you hear a doctor finally doing the odd, the last ditch effort, that that's what helps, you know, and, I'm very, very cautious, again, not getting sentimental about this, because not everyone who goes to Einsiedeln will be healed. Right. They seek out healing in these places. And, you know, if I, I, mean, I worked with a doctor years and years ago who was dying of cancer. And in the process, he was a wonderful man. And in the process, one thing he said to me, because he, he had been examined by doctors and told all this stuff, and he said, I have come to hate my profession, mm. the way I'm treated as a doctor, I'm not by doctors. And in his, in, his, in his work, Laura, in his psychological, spiritual work, in the end, he said, I have more health today than I had when I didn't have cancer. Mm. This cancer was the medium for him to find his truer self. He, and then eventually he died. Nothing sentimental about that, but he gained something powerfully. Now, you could say, well, gee, did it have to happen that way? I don't know. It did for him. He did not die a broken man. He died a fulfillment, fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So how do we put those mysteries together? You know? Yeah, I wonder if this is the people that are journeying to Einsiedlin to see the Black Madonna, if they're looking for what's missing in them because isn't that what ultimately heals us how we find our wholeness is to find what's missing to find the opposite absolutely i mean i gave a talk i bet it's been 35 years ago to a group of people i had just gotten back i was still fresh and blah 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 but at the end of the talk on the black madonna this guy raised his hand he said well if you're so into this black madonna why don't you become catholic and I, you know, I thought, what the heck is that about? This is not Catholic. This is not male. This is not female. This is a mystery we're talking about. This is a mystery that's missing in our culture. Can we not begin to think in that way? And if we can, maybe we can bring renewal to how we do do business economically, environmentally, politically, religiously. Maybe the, the churches and the synagogues and the mosques and find new understanding of what it means to honor mystery because i'm into mystery lately the how i'm into mystery lately because we don't have a lot recognition of it we think of mystery as woo 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 but it's not it's what we need to know that we can never know and I, i'm not saying no it's it's what we need to honor that we can never deeply know but is always there if we don't have mystery then we have that which is literal and I remember Louise von Franz saying literalism is just another form of materialism. If we can think of the mystery of of life, still ask the questions, we can still probe deeper and get some answers, but there's always going to be mystery beyond mystery. There's a lovely story. I think it comes from the uh, Ojibwa community, the Ashinabi, they call themselves. It was a story, it's perhaps mythical, but it was a woman who was giving a talk about her people's religion to a group of non-Indian people. And she was saying how 
the turtle is the great creator of all life and that uh, North America is Turtle Island and all creation was built upon the back of the turtle because the turtle is the first creator. And someone in the back room raised his hand and said, well, who created the turtle? And she said, thought for a moment, then she said, well, it's turtles all the way down. Mm. All of which is to say, you can never answer that question. It's mystery beyond mystery beyond mystery. And we may have a hard time accepting mystery in this culture. We want things answered. Yeah. So what is the Black Madonna? <sighs> you ask that question. I got to tell you, Laura, it's after all these years, I still ponder that question and feel clumsy even answering it today with you. But she is mystery, but that which we need to um, reflect on um, and try to answer how we integrate that into our personal lives and our own spiritual lives and into the lives of this culture that we live in. She's the missing piece. It isn't just the feminine that's missing. It's the dark feminine that's missing. You had mentioned earlier about being Catholic. I was actually raised Catholic, and I grew up with a statue in my bedroom, a Hummel porcelain statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary, white as a ghost. What is the difference between the white Madonna and the black Madonna? What does the white Madonna represent? What does the black Madonna represent? This is not a race issue. This is not, no. no. So, I mean, I was a little hesitant when I, I wanted to tweet about my interview with you today and tell people about your book and I uh, started reading it and I'd come across something that was tweetable, a quote, and I would quote it on Twitter and I thought, wow, I wonder if I'm going to get any comments that that I'm why am I being racist? Why am I pointing out that she's black? This is not about that. You know how we are in this country with with our racial tensions and how is how is this not about that? Well, it's not about that. But on the other hand, uh, I could see uh, African Americans being uh, feeling kind of good that this is this side is being honored. Okay, that there is a racial dimension to that, which I think is very appropriate. I mean, when I was in Zurich and I, uh, there was an American that came through just temporarily, a black guy, a black young guy, very nice guy. We started talking. I mentioned, I insisted him to him and the black Madonna. He made a point of going down there. Mm -hmm. and I got a, a letter from him shortly after saying he was so proud to stand in front of that statue mm -hmm. of the black. I get that. Okay. And the white goddess is not, the white Mary is not antithetical to the dark Mary. Okay, they're not like the full moon and the, and the dark moon are not antithetical to each other. Well, Jung is very glad uh, when Rome came out with the, the idea of the assumption of Mary because he, that side, the feminine side, at least in some way, was going to be recognized by the Catholic Church mm -hmm. the principle. And the Protestantism has been a bit, um, how do I say, even weak on that side. But the black feminine just takes the idea of the archetypal feminine to the next level. It balances. So you have a white god, a goddess and a black goddess. They are together. The white feminine can deal with the issues of life too, but the dark feminine takes it in a more compensatory way because of what's missing in our culture. That's what I'm trying to say. They're, they're probably the same. There are, they are no color, as Sri Ramakrishna said. There are no color if we look at them in the totality of things, okay? But in our culture, they're white because, well, the feminine is finally here, as we would understand her as people. But the dark feminine, the part we don't understand so much, that's deeper, it's truly not so sweet and mild, it's, it, it's not, again, out to get us, it's out to inform us of very, some very deep mysteries. Would you say that this relates at all to how women are perceived in our culture? Growing up in the United States as obviously a woman, there was always this expectation that I had to be good, that I had to be proper. Now, this is the way that I was raised, sure. that I had to be 
polite and nice. I can't stand that word. I had to be <laughs> nice. And we are more than that. And as a girl, I was squeezed into that role where I could only be those things. And all those other things that I was too, I didn't know where to put them. And that was not good because later on they came out. So what can the Black Madonna do for women, for girls in our culture, as far as embracing the other side of our nature? Yet I am answering through a male psyche and a male skin here. So uh, forgive me if I don't answer adequately. But to me, um, I have come to really like, and I mean this sincerely, being in the company of strong women who aren't afraid to give their opinion, to challenge me back, to um, fight for the causes that are right for their life, not be pushed around, but are extremely gentle and loving also. Mm. Because one does not exclude the other. So just because she's opinionated doesn't necessarily mean she's possessed by the animus. Not at all. As long as she consciously knows that she's not being possessed. Because, I mean, a, a woman can get possessed by uh, the animus, as certainly as a man can be by the anima uh, energies and get animated about the wrong cause. Mm -hmm. But, uh, no, a woman who can not, not betray her own feminine ground. I mean, I mean, granted, I understand how religion and culture and maybe families can lock a, a, a girl in uh, to stay a girl into her adult lives instead of maturing to be the woman she and life want her to be. It'd be like imagining what would the dark feminine goddess, as you might imagine her, say to you about what it is to be a woman? Is it to be weak and submissive and go along, hold your mouth shut and do what you're told? And I highly doubt that. Yeah, any more than it does uh, she say to a man, you're supposed to be tough and strong and not feel and always uh, fight and go off to war and do your things. No, no, you have to be strong. You have to be centered, stand on, uh, on your own two feet and say what you got to say. I, I, you know, we can betray ourselves, but we can also betray life by not pushing back on the limitations. I've worked with a number of Catholic uh, women and men, but the women especially, I mean, I can't believe the suffering that a lot of these women go through. Yeah, I see it in Protestantism too, but I tell you, and I don't like the way this sounds, the Catholic world historically has had this repression down to an art form, yeah. negative art form, and it's very, very bad. These women will say, <clears throat> working with a woman always says, I know in my head this is crazy, but my whole body and emotional system acts like a reflex. That I have to obey. <laughs> so I tell her, I think you need to learn how to sin. Mm. You know, that's yeah. the Black Madonna. There's an example. That the Black Madonna would say, go and sin. Break the rules and become the person you're supposed to become. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. So how does a woman differentiate between being a strong woman and crossing that line into what our like what our culture likes to call a bitch? Oh, she's shrewd. She's a bitch. Oh, come on. Yeah, as a man, I've gotten to a point where I usually can tell the difference because I don't take them as seriously when they slip into that anonymous possessed place. Because they often will go on and on and on and on yeah. and not be open to any other uh, input. Mm. My way is the right way, the highway, and you're, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. That's from me on the outside looking at But how does a woman differentiate that? I don't think she can because she's uh, in, into it unconsciously until she maybe steps back from the issues at hand, maybe gets a good night's sleep, listens to her dreams. Or get some feedback from people who maybe will question where she was coming from. It's tough. When when a man gets into an animal possession, how does he figure it out? Often he doesn't until some tragic thing happens. And um, 
through affairs or getting caught up in some cause that just goes nowhere and drains him. You know, it's um, because it's unconscious. I would hope I would have friends that would say, take me aside and say, Fred, you got to back off. You got to you look what you're doing. And, and or I would have enough wits about me to look at a dream that's warning me. But it's hard. It's hard. I'm not sure if I worded that the way that I wanted. Um, as a woman, if I'll use myself as an example, I don't mind. If I feel that I've been uh, wronged or taken advantage of, I will stick up for myself or I'll call somebody out on it. And immediately, it seems, I'm labeled a bitch. Oh, okay. That's different than what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, that, that's what I was referring to is that it just seems like I get further with people when I pour on this, I call it the Tory spelling, when I'm just so, you know, nice and valley girl and just ooing and eyeing over people and being, I mean, it's sickening, but it totally works and it's not authentic and it's not the way I want to be in the world. But if I, as I said, if I stand up for myself, if I call people out on things when I feel that I've been wronged or taken advantage of, then I'm a bitch. And I don't mm -hmm. want to go through the world like that either. But I think that it's that we don't know how to see strong women. We don't know what a strong woman looks like. We think that because this is the association that I have. I see that statue in my bedroom as a little girl, the white Madonna. And right. that I'm supposed to be this holy, um, what's the opposite of sin? Pure. But then I tell you, a lot of women suffer under what you're talking about, is who be able to stand up and protect themselves. But truly, and easy for me to say, okay, but truly, to really be honorable to yourself and your truth and the truth that life wants you to live, don't you have to? run um put up with being called a bitch i mean isn't that the horrible thing that has to happen where you have to kind of say okay i i if you're gonna call me a bitch i'm a bitch but i, I will not back off what i'm saying i mean you know you pay the price for it you may lose some friends i mean there I, I i think of a lot of the great people who who have stood up for causes paid mm -hmm. a price for it and of course the obvious ones are, are um peace activists like king and and so forth they paid a price for it. Yeah. But for them not to do it, they would have betrayed themselves. They would have betrayed life. They would have betrayed America in some cases. Yeah. In your case, it would be you betray yourself and what life wants you, what she, that dark side wants you. But I also think, you know, Laura, in your case or a case, a lot of women, I think you're using your situation for a lot of women here. Yeah. Have to think of Kali, the image of Kali. She holds a sword in one hand, a club in another, a severed head in the third, and yet she's not possessed because she offers a lotus bowl of nourishment. Also, mm. so what I do, I have to do. It's because I have to do it for the sake, for your sake, the one who calls me the bitch, and for the sake of women who are called a bitch when they should not be. You follow? I mean. It's not easy. What I'm saying, this is not sentimental at all. This is hard for women to do. Shoot, it's hard for men to not fall in line with doing what a man is supposed to do in, in say, corporate America, where you stand on the shoulders of your brothers out there and try to get to the top and slay who's anyone in your way mm -hmm. to get what? Yeah. Bigger salary, position. And in the process, you betray yourself as a man. So, I mean, there's... Men have paid a price too in different ways. And in some ways, and again, I'm cautious saying this, some ways I think women have it a little bit better because they at least know so much more than men do mm -hmm. the weight that they carry on their backs. Men are, men are pretty unconscious about what price they're paying because of, look at the, you know, hell, they got good money. They got a good position usually. They got women falling over them or whatever it is in the positions they're in. Why would a man think things are going wrong? Yeah. 
Well, and about the issue of being called names and being labeled difficult, shrewd, high maintenance, it makes me want to educate people and say, let's take a look at this. What where do these, I don't know what I'm trying to say here, where do these labels come from? What What are we not seeing that is actually healthy behavior? And we're seeing it as bad or wrong. Is it because we are so caught up in this white feminine and not allowing the other side to come in? No, I think you're right there. To let the other side, I, I, we've been calling it the dark feminine today let the darker, not so sentimental side come in to join up with the white feminine. White feminine, dark feminine, those are terms to capture the feminine archetype. The feminine archetype is nothing to mess with. She is to be honored. She's not out to get you. She's promoting life. She gives life. <laughs> but you have to defend it. Uh, uh, and there, you need men to help defend the feminine archetype. Unfortunately, more men are stepping forth on this one. So you know, what, I, what, what do you I, mean by that? Yeah, men have to defend the feminine. Yeah, what I mean by that? Exactly. If if someone, I'll give you an example. If someone abuses my wife verbally, I'm going to go after that guy. I'll, I'll let my wife handle it first, and I'll back her up if I have to put it that way. See, now wife, a, let me stop you there. That's interesting to me because as a as a, I'm thinking, as a Jungian analyst, you're an ordained minister. To hear you speak like that is really refreshing because I'm thinking that you're going to be now, now, everybody, let's take it easy. But you <laughs> sounded like you're in there to, 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 you know, fight and defend. Well, of course, my goodness, of course. I mean, it's interesting that you kind of refer to as I'm a Lutheran minister, therefore I should be no, 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 because that is an image that unfortunately. Um, people have of Christianity and because yeah. and we've, of course, we've given a reason for that, but you know, this whole Christian thing, this is another whole t podcast okay. thing because, because I told, I told many people lately because of all the crazy distorted stuff happening in religions nowadays, Christianity mm -hmm. included, I have to stop being a Christian in order to be one and give me a couple of hours to tell you what I mean by yeah, that. Yeah, what do you mean by that? Well, because <laughs> Christianity for me ought to be one of the most powerful, compassionate religions of the world and embraceive of all religions. Yes. And don't mess with me because if you do an unjust thing, I'm going to go after you to protect this person that you're being unjust to. It doesn't mean I'm going to hurt you and be cruel to you, but I'll stop you in any way I can. Martin Luther King was a, um, a, a Baptist minister and he brought America to his knees. Gandhi was a profound Hindu. He brought the European um, um, Britain down to their knees, you see, because he had the power to do that. And, and when there's injustice out there, I tell you, if it, particularly to my family or my friends or just some stranger in the street that's really being abused, mm -hmm. I, I'm going to step in. I'm sorry. I can't. Because you know why? I will not only betray that person that's being pushed around. I'll be betraying myself. People think Jesus was a real sweet and mild person. I mean, my God, you know, he stood up against the Roman Empire, against the Sanhedrin. I mean, he took a whip into the temple because they were bastardizing his religion. So he was a revolutionary. <laughs> what's, what's happened to us? How did we or why did we become so nice and so careful and so politically correct about everything? I don't know. I don't know. What, what, what happened? I think uh, maybe, Laura, on an evolutionary level, we had to go through all that to realize we have to take ourselves to the next level of a deeper kind of honesty. And I can understand the political correctness and all that, but and I will honor that up to a point, but there's a certain point where, you know, where we, let's move beyond that and, yeah. um, and just treat each other as human beings. You know, it's, when I've been on the reservation, uh, as I said, many, many, for many years, I remember one time, I've been very well received out there, I've been involved in uh, almost all their major ceremonies and vision quests and sun dances and so forth. I remember one woman years ago, she was pretty upset. It was the year of uh, honoring the massacre of Wounded Knee, 1990. It happened in 1890. 
she got up and she was really laying into the white people. Yeah, you go back and you take our ceremonies and you blah, 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 blah. and now here here in this gathering was this old medicine man, Elmer Running. He's since passed away. Beautiful man of the old school type, you know. Mm-hmm. I had had it. Here's this white boy. I thought I had. I can't. Let's say because I have been so deeply involved in. I'd done four vision. I danced many years and made friendships and family and everything out there. I got up to the microphone. I says, "Look, I need to tell you when we white people go back to our homes, we we go back and talk about you people in a beautiful way, and we defend you people, and we we uh, we do the ceremonies back there when we do do them in a very sacred way." And, Oh, by the way, my blood is as red as your blood. And I went on and on and on. Mm. And I thought, where did that courage come from? Something just stirred in me to do this in front of all these Native people. Mm -hmm. When I walked back to the arbor where we were all taking a rest, people got up and shook my hand, Indian people. Wow. Yeah. And I thought, okay, this is what you got to do sometimes. And I could have easily walked back and I could have been told, Get out of here. Go home. Right. But I, if I was a woman, I might have been called, you really are a bitch, girl. Yeah, exactly. So we take our chances. Of sometimes, I mean, I, something in me made me do that. I cannot take credit for that totally. Granted, I had to speak. But something in me was almost like, if I can put it in the context of our subject today, it's almost like she, that dark feminine firm, don't mess with me, sword in hand, lotus bow in the other hand, you get up there and say what you got to say. I have to give her credit because something in me made me do that. You follow? Yeah. I was not unconscious. I had to participate with that something in me. Yes. And you also mention in the book about the Black Madonna in Ein Siedlin is that she holds a chain with a heart at the end in the same hand that she holds the scepter. And you mentioned that the scepter and the heart are related, that she rules in love and with a gesture of relationship and understanding. She's holding both. I'm glad you mentioned the scepter because that's a good example of what she carries as a compensatory uh, side of the uh, of the culture that she was in and that she represents today. If you remember that there was a story associated with that scepter, because at the top of it there are two sprouting leaves, mm-hmm. and it's a, based on the Tannhäuser myth that was going around Europe at the time. Tannhäuser had uh, this young man had lived with the goddess Venus in the mountains for a long time, and when he came back to his people. The priests shunned him and said, you have to go to Rome and get repentance because of the sinful thing you did. So he goes to Rome and stands in front of the Pope and the Pope holds his wooden scepter and uh, says to him, you shall never be forgiven any more than this dead piece of scepter wood I'm holding will sprout leaves. So Tannhäuser leaves and he goes back home dejected. And he's on his deathbed practically. And, and then some runner comes from Rome saying, the, the Pope's scepter has sprouted leaves. In other words, what the collective cannot accept, the Black Madonna side of the psyche can. Mm. See? Yeah. And so a lot of truly sinful people could be forgiven by the dark feminine. It certainly is Jesus forgo- forgave the the worst of the worst. He didn't go off to the religious groups of those times and say, come follow me. He he talked to dirty fishermen and tax collectors and all kinds of crazy people. And they were the ones he appealed to. And they appealed to him. Mm -hmm. Now, if you translate that into the modern world, you don't have to be Christian to follow that. Any religion that's based on compassion would say, take care of the poor and the dying, the widows and the orphans and blah, blah, blah. What's wrong with that? What's so hard about that? It comes across even as simple a thing as give you give the waitress or the waiter an extra dollar tip. <laughs> you know, what's a dollar to you? A dollar to them means a lot. I mean, it's as small as that, or as as big as don't mess with that person because you're messing with me. 
It's got that thing that Jesus says, you slap me in my right side of my face, I'll turn you to my left. I won't play your game. However, he never said this. I wish he had. You slap my friend or my family's face, I'll go after you. See what I'm saying? It's a different dynamic. That's the Black Madonna. Uh. I'm not going to be a good boy, but neither will I be a bad man. You must no longer, Laura, or women of your generation, be a good girl. But don't be a bad woman. Be a strong woman. You got the feminine archetype on your side. Sometimes I think, I even wonder, geez, sometimes I think the feminine archetype is stronger than the masculine. I thought, wait, where's that coming from, Fred? <laughs> more patience, maybe. More understanding of um, the inconsistencies of life. In fact, I heard a thing just the other day of women uh, who have already been in combat or are seeing the horrible traumatic things. They Somehow they can handle that better than men can. They don't get as much PTS as men will get. I thought, what is that about? Are they more aware of the darker sides? I don't know. That, that's interesting that you mentioned that because there used to be a television show on um, back in the 90s called Northern Exposure. Oh, I love that program. Well, I've seen every single episode many times. I have the DVDs. And there was one episode where I think it was Jane, the school teacher, has a conversation with Maggie about why women don't belong in combat. Because I think Jane was in the military for a while and Maggie asked her, have you ever seen any combat? And she said, the last thing you want is a woman with her finger on the trigger of a tomahawk missile. And Maggie was, you know, she's this strong, independent bush pilot woman was really surprised to hear Jane respond that way. And Jane said, you know, women are too temperamental and emotional and hormonal. We're either getting our periods or getting over having our periods or having our periods. And we've got about one good week a month. And I thought back then I thought, yeah, you know, she's right. And so uh, I would think about that from time to time. And just hearing you say that, that's fascinating that women are able to handle the realities of combat better than men, and they're getting post-traumatic stress disorder less frequently. Well, again, I just heard that. I, uh, I'm, I'm going to keep my eye on that one. But, you know, this whole thing about women being hormonal, they can't handle it. I mean, to me, it's, it's really wrong. Because like saying, Gee, men never get moody. Men never get reactive. Men are always reactive. They're always ready to punch someone out. You know, I mean, okay, now that's an overstatement, but you know what I mean? We no, have I that know. side too. Yeah. We have that side too. You know? See how programmed I am though, that I, I totally bought that. Well, that was what, how many, how many years ago? That's all. That's been off the air a long time. So we change our attitudes and our opinions I have over the years too, yeah. you know? Yeah, that's true. That was, yeah before analysis. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I also wanted to mention the child that the black Madonna is holding. Mm -hmm. Would you say a little bit about that? Well, I think he's uh, the expression, of course, it's Christ child, but I think he would be the expression of the new consciousness that, you know, he, to me, the Christ child is the symbol of all that we might know about God. However, you would use that word is incarnate in our presence, whether it's actually in another human being or in all of nature itself, that somehow we see the dark side of it also, the mystery side of it. He is the newborn thing. He's the new consciousness. Can we, she gives birth to the new consciousness, which is of herself. Can we not integrate him and what he symbolizes into our own life? That's what I think she, that means. The mm -hmm. child is that new consciousness. It's the new thing. It's the new potential. Can we see the dark side? I mean, a lot of this stuff is evolving, I think, in our own culture, politically, environmentally, economically. We're slowly, slowly beginning to see the other sides of what we need to deal with. But it's whether we make it or not is a question. But we are beginning to slowly see this thing from racism to environmentalism to the craziness in our political structures to our interconnection worldwide, to our planetary system, slowly, the stuff sinks in slowly. The child is born, but it, it needs to be taken care of and to grow and to make become actual, incarnate among us. 
And I don't mean that in a Christian way. I don't mean that as a Christian statement incarnate among, incarnate among us. I mean, it, what he symbolizes is for people of all religions and all ways of life. He is the new thing that we need to be mindful of. So he's the third thing. He unites He unites the differences exactly. of, of the masculine and the feminine principles of Logos and Eros. You say in the book that the coming together of those two principles and the drama of their struggle gives birth to a third and a new thing, a son who unites the differences in himself. There you got it. Thank you. Yeah. Sometimes when I've uh, spoken on this, I almost wish that I was not of the Christian heritage because people can write me off as someone, oh, that's where he's coming from. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, partly, but mostly not. It's, it's bigger than that. It's, it involves all of us. I'm very grateful to Dr. Gustafson for his generosity and willingness to speak with me today. Thank you again, Dr. Gustafson. For more information about the topics that were mentioned during the interview, please visit the website speakingofjung.com. I've also written a blog post about my visit to Einsiedlen, which includes several of the photos that I took, as well as more information about the monastery and the Black Madonna herself. On the website, you'll also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to listen to or download for free. This podcast is also available on iTunes and on Stitcher, and on the website, you'll find links for those as well. I'd like to thank Jungian analysts Marion Woodman, Robert Hinshaw, and Christina Becker for introducing me to the Black Madonna. A special thank you to United Airlines and the Park Hyatt Zurich. And my eternal gratitude, as always, to Sean Lau, Charlie Arthur, and Diane Braden. This is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung. Speaking of Jung.